few announcements. Um, this is the last theory lunch of the semester, um, and the last theory lunch that I'll be organizing. Next semester, I mean, it, we'll pick up in the fall. Um, Nick and Ellis, who I don't see, will be in charge. Um, so thank you for a great theory lunch semester. Um, and now, without further ado, um, David is going to tell us about randomized online matching and regular tests. Uh, all right, so today I'm going to talk to you about uh, joint work with uh, Ilan Cohen from uh, Hebrew University. This is work we uh, did mostly last semester at uh, Simons Institute. We were both visiting there. Uh, if you guys haven't met Ilan, you're in luck. Ilan will be coming here next uh, semester for a post. All right, so assuming we all know what matchings are, let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve. Okay, so in the online mod uh, matching uh, problem, the underlying input is a bipartite graph. Left vertices, right vertices, and an edge set. Uh, the left side, also known as the offline nodes, is uh, known a priori. So we already know the offline nodes ahead of time. The right side, also known as the online nodes, are revealed over time online together with their edges. I'll have an animation in a second. An online matching algorithm has to match arriving nodes immediately and irrevocably. Okay? When, a, when an online node shows up, let's say this guy, uh, the online matching algorithm has to decide who, if at all, to match it to among its unmatched neighbors. And then uh, no matches, right? That's, that's the case. So for example, say the first online ma node gets matched to uh, the second offline node. The second online node shows up and gets matched. Well, it can't get matched to this guy. Let's say it gets matched to the fourth offline node. And let's say a third online node shows up. And unluckily for it, it can't get matched to anyone right? because its single neighbor is already matched. So this guy's a little disappointed. All right, so the dynamics are clear. All right, so what's, uh, what's the general objective? As with most uh, online algorithms, what we're trying to do is, in this case, it's a maximization problem. We're trying to maximize the competitive ratio, which is defined to be, for any algorithm, ALG. The competitive ratio of ALG is the minimum overall input graphs G of the expected size of the matching output by ALG on G over the optimum size of the matching. That is the maximum matching size. Um, I'll just uh, stress out right here, the expectation is over the randomness of the algorithm. There's no, expect there's no randomness of the algorithm. Uh, so back to the example here, uh, it's easy to see that uh, you could get a matching of size three. So you match this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. But if this were a deterministic algorithm, it only got two, so it's, expect it's competitive ratio is at most two thirds. A uh, quick bit of notation, if the competitive ratio of an algorithm is alpha, we'll say the algorithm is alpha competitive. So far, pretty, uh, pretty standard uh, stuff. Um, so let's see what we can actually do in this setting. So the first thing we'll uh, consider are deterministic algorithms. And the natural first uh, algorithm to look at for any problem is the greedy algorithm, which in this case matches each online vertex t, that is the, the online vertex that arrives at time t, to some arbitrarily, arbitrary unmatched neighbor. Uh, so this gives us a maximal matching, to contrast with the maximum matching. A maximal matching is a one-half approximation to a maximum matching, so this is at least one-half competitive. And it's easy to see that any deterministic algorithms can do better than one-half competitive. And, okay, I'm saying it's easy, let's uh, show a quick example. So for this instance, say the deterministic algorithm matches the, the diagonal edge, and now another online node shows up and is, of course, very, very simple. Um, Good, so we could have matched two edges, right? The, the horizontal edges, we only got one, one half of it. And we can extend this to arbitrarily large inputs, so despite this being a somewhat contrived instance, you can, you can blow it up to whatever site. Okay, so uh, a little disappointing. The, the most trivial and uh, boring algorithm is, is optimal amongst deterministic algorithms. Let's see what we can do with randomization. All right, so the first random algorithm you think of is just, you know, match randomly amongst the unmatched neighbors that you have, right? Just pick one of the unmatched neighbors uniformly at random. So again, this gives you a maximal matching, so it's at least one half competitive. Uh, unfortunately, this is at most one half plus little order of one competitive. As the following instance shows, I'll give you a minute to parse this. So we have uh, n offline nodes and online nodes. The, the first n over two online nodes neighbor the guy that's just Cross them horizontally, and all the n over two bottom guys. Right. Then the last n over two online nodes only neighbor the guy horizontally in front. Uh, so intuitively, what you'd expect to see, and you can make this formal, 
pretty much all of the online guys here will match that. Right? The vast majority of their neighbors are in the n over two guys over here. So we expect to find something like this. And the vast majority of the n over two guys over here will be sad. We only have roughly one half repetitive solution. If you don't follow it, don't, don't worry. This is not particularly uh, important for the problem. All right, so this uh, naive random algorithm does uh, pretty poorly. Let's see what we can really get. So the algorithm ranking introduced by Karp, Vazirani, and Vazirani in 1990 does the following. On initialization, it picks a random permutation, a uniformly, a uniformly chosen permutation on the left-hand side. Does that list the permutation? And whenever an online node T shows up, it's matched to its unmatched neighbor I that minimizes the value of the permutation. So at least for this input, you should get some intuition as to why this, this would help. Uh, let's say after half of these guys show up, all the guys here of value within the first n over two are already matched. And now every guy here has a constant probability of getting matched. Again, if you didn't follow that, not particularly important. We're not analyzing this algorithm at all. Yes, Anton? David, when you say there, we can't, you know, at least I can't see the little red dot. So sure. Uh, so I don't remember what there was for this particular example. As I was saying, this isn't particularly okay. important. I'll, okay. Yeah, I'll try and use the laser pointer a little bit. Um, all right, so at least for this instance, it does better. And actually, in general, it does better. So what CARP and uh, many people uh, later uh, proved is that this algorithm is 1 minus 1 over E competitive. Uh, so just to be absolutely clear, 1 minus 1 over E is 0.632. The exact value isn't particularly important. It's just strictly greater than 1 half. So randomization gets you something compared to deterministic algorithms. Right? We said deterministic algorithms can beat 0.5. And uh, you might wonder if you can do better, but uh, unfortunately, you can. All randomized algorithms are at most 1 minus 1 over E competitive for this problem. So ranking is the optimal algorithm. Right? Uh, this was a fun talk. See you guys next semester. Really <laughs> nothing, nothing more to show here. Um, all right, that's, that's not quite the whole story. So let's see why we might be a little displeased with this problem. So uh, Meta, Saberi, Vazirani, and Vazirani showed in 2005 that you can relate online matching and its, its extensions to internet advertising. So this is great news because internet advertising is uh, big bucks. So uh, I think this, uh, this plot is a little out of date. I think this would be close to 70. But regardless, the <laughs> online ad spending in the US alone in 2016 was over $60 billion. All right, so a lot of money. Um, I'll, I'll make, maybe make the, extent, the, the relation to internet advertising a little less uh, obscure. So offline nodes are advertisers. We know advertisers ahead of time. At the beginning of the day, they say, I want to show ads to this kind of people. Uh, online uh, nodes are ad slots. So when you click on a web page, you generate an online node, which should be shown one, or at most one, uh, ad. Okay. This is, I mean, uh, the way I'm describing it right now doesn't really capture a lot of uh, what's going on, but we're, we're not going to go too far into this. Uh, too much into this. Um, I'd like to point out that for all these generalizations and extensions of online matching, we know that 1 minus 1 over E competitive is the best you can possibly do. Right? Um, so why are we displeased with this? Well, 1 minus 1 over E is optimal, so algorithmically that's very nice, but uh, 1 over E, which is roughly 36% of 60 billion bucks, is, is, is a lot of money. Right? That's uh, not, uh, not really uh, something we'd be happy about. And also, if you look at the tight instances uh, for the 1 minus 1 over E bound, they're very, 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 I can't stress it enough, very contrived instances that have very little to do with the application. Um, so what researchers have, uh, have done, I mean, they, you want to get better results for practical input. So what researchers have done, uh, uh, they've considered structural assumptions on the input, as well as stochastic assumptions. The input comes from some distribution, the input is randomly permuted, you name it. Uh, so I'd like to point out that for stochastic assumptions, uh, under stochastic uh, arrival models, we know that we can beat the 1 minus 1 over E bound of the adversarial arrival, which is what we'd be talking about today. But you still can't get the 1 competitive. You're still, uh, I think for all of these uh, input models, we can't beat 0.823 or something that falls apart. Okay, so we've gone over, uh, over history for the general problem. Let's talk a little bit about uh, regular graphs which will be the, the inputs of uh, choice for our talk today. So in uh, regular graphs, each node has exactly d neighbors. So for a bipartite graph, that means that the number of offline and online nodes is exactly the same. Yes? Oh, sorry. Sorry. 
So for the stochastic, you can't get one because there's a proof, or you, maybe you can get one and people don't know how to do it. You can't get one for online matching. You cannot. Some of the extensions you can, but for online matching, you cannot. Okay. Yes. Go. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an impossibility result. It's not where we don't know yet. We we know we can. Right. So as I was saying, uh, regular graphs. Each node has a uh, degree precisely d. Uh, for bipartite no, uh, for pi sorry. Roll back. Uh, for bipartite graphs, this means that there are exactly the same number of online and offline nodes. Just count the edges. Uh, so we'll denote the number of left and right nodes by n. Okay. And uh, one corollary of uh, Hall's theorem is that uh, any regular bipartite graph has a perfect match. You can match all vertices simultaneously. Um, all right, so there's, there's a long history of uh, study of uh, regular graphs in uh, TCS and CS as a whole. Uh, I won't really go into it, but uh, anyway. Um, I, will, I will actually uh, maybe stress out uh, the, the stu that people have studied this in the offline model. And in the offline model, we know how to compute the perfect matching in linear time for regular graphs. This is uh, the end of a, a long uh, series of, uh, of papers. And actually, we can even do sublinear time with randomization. Okay, so randomization definitely helps in the offline model. And a uh, quick contrast with uh, general graphs, notice that uh, the state-of-the-art uh, maximum matching algorithms of uh, Hopkoff and Karp from uh, over 40 years ago and uh, Madri's recent uh, breakthrough are both strictly uh, slower than uh, linear. All right, so this was a bit of a digression. Let's, let's get back to the uh, online model. So what do you know about uh, online matching and regular graphs? So in recent uh, work with uh, Sefino, I showed that the optimal competitive ratio for deterministic algorithms is, ignore the left-hand side for a second, strictly greater than one minus one over here. Okay, um, great, so let's put this in perspective. So what we said earlier is for general graphs, you can beat one minus one minus one minus one over E, even with randomized algorithms. For deterministic algorithms, we showed that we can do strictly better for deterministically. Uh, however, as D grows, this, this gets worse and worse. Right? This, this tends to one minus one over E, and uh, just to uh, stress this out one more time, this is the optimal competitive ratio. So then this is, this is really all you could possibly get for the deterministic algorithm. Okay, so the problem inherently gets harder as the increase. Not just for, the, for our particular algorithm. Okay, and for stochastic arrival models, the random algorithms we discussed earlier, random and ranking, in different uh, stochastic arrival models are one minus order one over square root of D competitive. Okay, that means as D increases, the problem gets easier under random arrival. Okay, so this kind of begs the, begs the following question. What can we do with randomization? What can randomized algorithms do under adversarial arrival? Question clear? Great, so without further ado, let's tell you what the results are. So what, uh, what we did in the, this work is presented a new randomized algorithm which on D regular graphs, again, in the adversarial arrival model, is one minus order square root log D over square root of D competitive. Um, so basically we show that the problem gets easier as D increases for randomized algorithms, even in the adversarial arrival model. And notice that uh, up to this uh, square root log D term, we, we match the results that are known for the much easier stochastic arrival model. Right. Uh, other than that, we show that our algorithm is roughly the same, uh, sorry, achieves roughly the same competitive uh, ratio with high probability. So it doesn't deviate much from, uh, from this uh, competitive ratio. Uh, this is the first uh, with high probability result in the adversarial model. And finally, our algorithm matches any given vertex with probability tending to one as d tends to infinity. Don't worry about the exact dependence. So uh, this, this also gives some kind of fairness guarantee. Every vertex has a good chance of getting matched. This also says something about the vertex-weighted variance of the problem. So if vertices have different values, maybe some vertex is worth more to match than others, we're still going to get something like this. Yes, please. The vertices are both the online and the both offline. Both the online and the offline. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, so for, um, for the adversarial arrival model, results were known for the variant where the offline vertices have weight. 
no results were known for variants where the online parentheses have weights. Whereas here we, we get that. Thanks. Any other questions? All right, so that's, uh, that's the positive results. On the hardness side, we showed that no algorithm is better than one minus order one over square root of d competitive. So again, up to the square root log d, our algorithm is tight. And uh, well, not a hardness result per se. Uh, we also show that ranking and uh, random are both one minus omega one competitive. So uh, even as d grows to, uh, to infinity, uh, Random is at best uh, I don't know, 11 over 12 competitive, and ranking is at, the, at most uh, 70. Okay, so again, not a hardness result per se. It just shows that we actually needed a new algorithm. We could just use something off the shelf. Yes, Andrew. So on the previous slide, you said ranking plus random is one minus. Uh, ranking and random are both. Uh, so it's not like some kind of combination of the two. For, one, for some stochastic arrival model, ranking is one minus order one over square to be competitive. And for another one, uh, random does the same. Yes? So for deregular graphs in the previous slide, you said that deterministic algorithms kind of converge to this 1 minus 1 over e. Yeah. Um, but for general graphs, it's 1 half, right? Sure. Um, is the bound. Is there a way to define kind of like the distance between deregular and general graphs and see like there should be like a trade off as 1 minus 1 over e farther away from deregular, closer to general, gets to 1 half? Sure. Um, so the, the previous work I mentioned with Cephi kind of um, generalized regular graphs. I, I wouldn't say that it really measures some kind of distance to regularity, but that would be a, an interesting uh, follow-up uh, follow work, I think. I mean, in, in some sense, we can generalize our results to something that's close-ish to regular. I, I'd be happy to talk about it off. Yes? Is it your first hardness? Is that a poly time algorithm or any algorithm? Oh, this is, uh, this is uh, information theoretic hardness. Oh. I mean, you just... No, you can't prepare for all the eventualities, right? And which, is, which is kind of uh, common for online algorithms. We generally just say, look, you can't do anything regardless of how much computation time you throw at it. Okay, great. Um, that being said, let's, uh, let's start talking about our algorithm. So we'll start with a rough intuition. So what we'd like to do is make sure that every edge gets matched with probability roughly one over d. Okay, uh, since we want to get something that has a competitive ratio tending to one. This is the rough ballpark of where we have to get to. So first of all, as I was saying, if, uh, if edges are matched much less on average, we can't possibly get something tending to one. All right, so this is an easy calculation, right? Like every offline vertex has D neighbors. If each of its edges is matched with probability roughly one over D, each off online node will be matched with probability roughly one. Okay, so this, this part uh, at least, um, seems intuitively uh, make a lot of sense. Uh, actually, we also want to make sure we don't match any edge too much. Okay, in particular, if a lot of edges are matched much more than one over D on average, then we're likely to find some online nodes T whose neighbors are likely to be matched before T shows up. That make sense? A few nods? Good. Uh, all right. So before I uh, start uh, delving into uh, you know, the problems that our algorithm faces, let's maybe uh, give a bit of notation, which will make things a bit easier. So the first uh, notation we introduce is f of t is the set of free or unmatched offline vertices by time t. And uh, f t i will be an indicator for whether or not i is free by time t. Right. And d t i will be the degree of i before time t. Uh, so I think the first two uh, Notation should be simple enough. Let's do quickly a uh, degree just to make sure we understood this. So for this particular input, at the beginning DTI is uh, in some sense in undefined. First online node shows up, everyone has DTI zero. Right? Before this guy showed up, no one had any edges. Right? Second online node shows up, all the guys that made with the first one have DTI equals one. Third online node shows up, all the guys that made with this guy have their DTI equal one. Definition plus animation, clear enough. <clears throat> and uh, just to avoid some uh, pedantry later on, uh, for indicator variables x, we'll have probability of x denotes the probability that x equals one. That is its expectation. Good. All right. So let's let's now that we have all these definitions and everything's, uh, we'll, we'll start uh, we'll start using them. Let's look at the first challenge we might face. So. For our first example, we'll have an online vertex T that has D neighbors. 
V over two of which have Bti equals zero, that is T is their first ever neighbor. These are uh, what we term the low degree neighbors. And V over two of these neighbors have Bti equals V over two, we call these guys high degree neighbors. And all of these guys were previously matched independently. Okay, so by independently I mean there's, well, exactly, exactly that. Uh, each of these guys has some probability of being matched before and it's completely independent of what happened before. Uh, just imagine that there's no, no path between these guys in the sub graph zone. Okay, um, so where's, where's the difficulty here? Well, at least for algorithm random, if we match all the edges before with probability roughly one over D, which recall is our general, uh, general goal, then the high degree neighbors are all matched before with probability roughly one over D times their previous degree, right? Times V over two, which is one half. So out of these V over two high degree neighbors, we expect about V over four of them to be matched, right? Half of them to be matched. All right, why is this problematic? Well, because this means that, the, oh, by the way, since, uh, since they're matched independently, we also expect this to be highly concentrated. Right? It's just a high level intuition that this is so uh, what we find is the probability of a low degree neighbor i to be matched to t is one over the number of free neighbors that t expects to see, which is three d over four. Right? Out of its d neighbors, we expect d over four of them to be already matched. So this is four over three d, and this, unfortunately for us, is too high. Okay, I won't expand this to a full, uh, to a full uh, bad instance for random, but you can, you can push this uh, further. Um, Right, so how could we go about this, like solving this problem? Uh, well, for at least for this instance, the fix is relatively simple. So what we're going to do is assign each of T's neighbors, each of T's unmatched neighbors, sorry, a weight. Uh, it'll be one for the low degree neighbors. And it'll be two for the high degree neighbors. Okay, so low degree neighbors are free with probability one, right? This is their first ever neighbor, so their expected weight is one. High degree neighbors, we just argued, are matched with probability roughly one half, so their expected weight is roughly one as well. One half by two. One. Uh, and what we're going to do next is match T to a neighbor I with probability proportional to its weight. So with probability WTI over the sum of the weights. WT will indicate the sum of the weights. And now what we find is that the probability of a low degree to be matched to T is roughly one over D. And likewise for the high degree. Okay, so at least for this instance, it looks like we, we kind of uh, solved, uh, solved the problem. Uh, let me generalize this ever so slightly for, for our general uh, approach. Okay, so the first part of our solution, we're going to have assigned weights as follows. For every online vertex T, its free neighbors will get assigned the weight WTI, which is one over their probability of being free. And then again, we match T to a neighbor I with probability WTI over WT. Okay. Question? All right, so again, same rough intuition as before. The expected sum of weights is by linearity sum of the expected weights. And for each of these guys, well, this is the weight, and that's the only time he actually gets a weight. So this cancels out, it's a one. We're summing over D neighbors, so the expected sum of weights <laughs> is D. Okay, so if the sum of the weights were always its expectation, bit of a tall order, but uh, let's imagine for a second. Then for each neighbor i of t, the probability that i gets matched to t is its weight over d times the probability that it's free. This is, uh, this is the probability that it gets matched. And since the weight of i is one over the probability of i being free, this guy and this guy cancel out, so we get one over d. Okay. What, what are these probabilities what are these probabilities? This is uh, our, our random algorithm, right? So a round, an algorithm that does this exactly at every step. Yes, thank you. Um, so is that easy to compute? That's not clearly easy to compute, and that's, that's going to be at least part of our problems. Uh, by no means the, the worst of our problems. Um, so one, one problem that uh, might be pretty obvious is if we manage to get exactly one over D all the time, this would give us a one competitive algorithm, uh, which I argued earlier is impossible. Okay, so, I mean, that's, that's not too surprising because we're assuming something here that makes no sense, right? 
no random variable is always going to be its expectation unless it's constant. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go over the second part of the challenges we'll face. So every neighbor of T will be matched with probability its weight over the sum of weights, which is going to be one over the probability of R being free times the sum of the weights. And uh, the difficulty, as I said, is that the sum of weights can deviate from its expectation of T. Right? Why is this problematic? Well, if it's lower than its expectation, then uh, the edge IT will get matched with probability strictly greater than WTI over D, which will give us a probability greater than one over D of getting matched. And on the other hand, if it's higher, well, we'll get too low a probability of getting matched. Yes. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to talk about this too much, but this gets even worse if you take into account possible positive correlation between uh, the two. If the fact that one vertex is uh, free means that the others are likely to be free, then I'm very likely to be in this range, where the sum of weights is too high. Um, you're confused, it looks like you're happy for some kind of direct question. Right. You're just trying to adjust the probability so that you sort of stay within a short band of yeah. probability, right? Actually, I'm going to do something even better than that. I'm going to make sure that we get exactly that probability at every, at every point in time. Okay, so kind of following up on, uh, on Ravi's question, what we're going to do and as part of our solution will comprise of two parts. The first part will be, we'll output a non-maximal matching. And the second part will be a notion of marking, which I'll expand on in a second. So what do we do for our non-maximal uh, solution? Well, if the sum of weights is strictly less than D, we'll only match T with probability sum of the weights over D, which will be strictly less than one. In other words, with the complementary probability, we'll just ignore T and not match it. Just to give its neighbors a higher chance of still being alive for their future neighbors. Okay. Uh, this particular choice of uh, probability will be clear in maybe two slides. Uh, on the other hand, if the sum of the weights is too high, remember now we have too low a probability of getting matched, then we'll match extra edges, we'll match extra edges uh, to increase the marginal probability of getting matched. Now this makes no sense, right? When we're talking about the matching, that's a vertex disjoint set of edges. T can't, T can't be matched more than once. Okay, so that'll bring us up to this uh, notion of marking, which I'll introduce in the next slide. So again, our general hope is to match each edge with probability roughly one over D, and our approach will be as follows. Introduce this notion, we introduce this notion of marking, so we mark each edge with probability exactly one over D, such that all matched edges are marked, and most marked edges are matched. So um, what we said earlier, we'll match T with some probability, and every node will be ma uh, matched to T with probability proportional to its weight. Uh, so those guys get uh, get marked as well, and in addition, we'll also mark extra edges, just for kicks. Okay. Um, so quick definition, so we're on the same page later on. We'll say an offline vertex with a marked edge is matched, and to guarantee that all matched edges are marked, we'll only mark edges of free that is unmarked offline vertex. So we've we've given a few uh, bits and pieces of our uh, general approach. I'll, I'll give the algorithm for fully in two slides. I just want to go over the notation one more time, uh, just to make sure that we're absolutely on the same page. So notice that we've changed the, not the definition of free vertices. Now a free vertex is an unmarked vertex. Uh, so FP is the set of unmarked vertices, free vertices. FPI is again an indicator for whether or not you're free, which again I stress means unmarked. And DTI is the degree of I before time t. So we have an animation for that earlier. We're going to go over it again. Uh, finally, delta TI is going to be the residual degree of I before time t. And so that's how many more neighbors it expects to find after t inclusive, at time t and later. So for example, this input is uh, three regular. So if you want to find out what the value of DTI here, are, just you know, subtract three, subtract three again. So we've gone through notation, we've gone through a bit of uh, intuition, let's actually get the algorithm. So our algorithm, which we call marking, 
x as follows. For every online vertex t, we assign each of t's neighbors a weight, v over delta ti times whether times the indicator of whether or not they're free. Right? So if they're free, they get this value, and if not, they get a value of v. Uh, so Guru, for your question early on whether or not the probability of FTI will be easy to compute, will shortly show that this is one over the probability of FTI. Okay, bit of a spoiler. Uh, all right, what do we do after that? So with probability, the minimum between sum of the weights over d and one, we'll choose some neighbor of t with probability proportional to its weight, match t to this guy, and mark. And uh, here I remind you that this uh, with probability min wt over d was supposed to take care of this side of the bell curve. Right? Just make sure that uh, all of uh, t's uh, neighbors don't get matched with too don't get sorry marked with too high a probability. And finally, we said we'll also increase the margins a little bit. So if the sum of weights is too high, for each of t's neighbors, we'll mark it with some additional probability. Don't worry about this exact value. It's just used to kind of make things work out. Um, and this, I remind you, takes care of the right side of the curve. If the sum of weights is too high, then uh, the neighbors have too low a probability of getting matched. So we just mark them with some extra probability. Yes, sir. So, this, so once you mark a vertex as FTI, FTI, that becomes zero? Because FTI but, uh, is zero, yes, exactly. Okay. Any other questions? This thing over here? So you're choosing to do something. You're, you're marking everybody. Yeah. You're, you're picking your guy, you're marking him, and then you're additionally marking. And addition of mark, yeah. What, what's the, what delta is like how far you are from D? Uh, delta Ti is the residual degree. It's uh, how many more neighbors you expect to see. So if I have a very low residual degree, you're bumping up my weight. Yeah. Your weight's going to be huge, right? It's, yeah. And this kind of makes sense uh, intuitively, right? If, if you only have the one, one extra neighbor, uh, I mean, it's now never, right? You, you aren't getting any younger. Right. Nick, you had a question? Yeah, um, just to clarify, is NT just a neighbor? Oh, and NT is just a neighbor, yes. But neighbors that are free, right? Uh, like, no, I mean, neighbors in general, right? So the, the weight of unmatched, of, sorry, of, uh, of matched, sorry. Marked. Of marked, thank you. Oh, that's right, yeah. Are, is zero, right? That's right. So yeah, those guys have zero probability. Oh. And the only difference between marked and saturated is the marked guys are also fake saturated. Marked guys also contain, yes, fake. fake. Superfluously is the word we use. Any other questions? So hopefully the algorithm makes a bit more sense after all the discussions and after having uh, discussed it a little. Um, yeah. Yes. One more thing. Uh, could you, again, give me some intuition for what it means for the weights to be very high, the WT to be much Yes, easier. so if the, if the weight of any particular guy is very high, oh, you mean the, the sum of the weights or yeah. the, oh, yeah. the sum of the weights. Uh, sum of the weights in some sense means that you have more unmarked neighbors than you expected to see. Okay, I'll, I'll shortly show that the expectation is exactly D. Uh, I mean, we've discussed this before, but I'll, I'll shortly show it. Um, so if you have more unmarked neighbors than you'd expect, uh, most of these guys won't get, I mean, you can't match more than one, right? So they, they won't get enough. Uh, they have too small a probability of getting matched and therefore marked. So, so I want you to so reconcile it with the thing. You said a yeah. single guy's weight is large if it's residual is very small. Right? If it's residual degree is very small, yes. So if it's, if it's still alive, right? If it hasn't been, if it's still free, right. and, it has, and it has very few uh, future neighbors that are expected to show up. So, you know, can I can I link that to the fact that the total weight is? I mean, if the total weight is large, that that also relates. So I was saying you have more than expected under some some metric, and in particular, if you have a lot of high degree neighbors that are still alive, you're like, what happened? You guys should have been marked ages ago, right? So I'll try and mark you now, just so you kind of get out of the way. So the absolute yes. worst thing that can happen is. All my D neighbors and their last edge, and they're all unmarked. Yes. So all highly unlikely, but yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. yes. And in which case, you, I mean, if you go through the map here, you'll find that they, they're all marked immediately at that point. Any more questions? Great. All right, so let's.
let's push the algorithm to the side. Uh, the algorithm is going to be following us for pretty much the rest of the talk. Uh, nothing really changed compared to the other slide. You know, uh, text became uh, you know quantifies, etc. So question: So this is yes. awesome. what's the algorithm matching? So you only oh, so the matching is only here. Only here. You never this is the only place I match. Okay. And in addition, I also mark some guys just for the heck of it. Oh, really, just for the heck of it. Okay, uh, so here's the high-level uh, roadmap of how we're going to analyze this thing. And we'll see how much of this we, we manage to pack in the next 20-odd uh, minutes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll bound the probability of an online vertex being unmatched, not being matched, in terms of the standard deviation of the sum of weights associated to its edges. Okay, uh, in particular, we'll show this in uh, four, four or five slides. Uh, for all online nodes t, the probability of t not being matched is the standard deviation <coughs> of wt over d. I believe this for, for a bit. Uh, now what we'll need to do is bound the average standard deviation of wt. And uh, to this end, what we'll do is, first of all, bound the variance of particular weights. And in addition, we'll prove uh, negative correlation between these weights. This, this part over here will, pr will prove uh, crucial. Uh, I guess both of them will be. All right, so this is very, very high, high level, uh, you know, 10,000 feet, uh, feet over the ground. Let's, uh, let's maybe start with uh, bounding the variance of WTI. So what did you mean by average standard deviation? So the average standard deviation, I'm, I'm just averaging over all n online nodes. Oh, all the nodes? Yes. Yeah. Um, all right, so in order to bound the variance of uh, the weight WTI, Let's, uh, let's get a little more in depth. Last notation, I swear. Uh, MIT is an indicator for the edge IT being marked. Okay. Uh, well, we wanted this to be, uh, to have probability one over D of uh, being true. So that's, that's indeed our first level. For every edge IT, the probability that IT gets matched, uh, sorry, marked is one over D. And I claim that this means that the probability of i being free at time t is delta ti over d. Right, just to see this, uh, fti is just 1 minus sum over all these guys. Right, for me to be free, I need to not have been marked before. Right, and every time your degree increases, uh, the probability of being free decreases by 1 over d. And this decreases every time you get an extra d. Right, delta ti with the residual, it's d minus the degree so far. Stage T, when okay. you mark I, it means you mark the edge IT. I mark the edge IT. Also, also the vertex IT. Right. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and back to uh, Hulu's question a while back. Uh, this means that D over delta TI will be exactly one over probability FTI. Um, yeah, great. So I, I claim I don't need to calculate anything, right? Like just uh, keeping track of degrees is uh, pretty easy. Okay, uh, let's see how we prove this. This is uh, maybe like a four line at best. Uh, so for any set of fr potential free vertices, A, which contains I, the probability of the edge IT being marked is uh, conditioned on A being the set of free vertices. I claim is exactly WTI over D, uh, which you'll notice is exactly one over delta T. It's this thing over D, it's one over delta T. Um, so I'll give you one I'll, I'll give you a proof of this claim just for one instance. So if the sum of the weights is at most d, right, this thing happens, this does not, the chance of I, the probability of it getting marked is, well, t actually marks someone who's the, f the first probability, wt over d. And in particular, it marks i, in that case, was this probability, the weight of i over the sum of the weights. Sum of the weights cancel out. We get wti over d. Um, have you done this uh, quick calculation? The, the, the opposite case where WT is greater than D is, I mean, it's not very, uh, very insightful. This probability here is just made to make sure that we get this event. Okay, uh, why, does, why is this good? Well, that means that if we condition over all these sets A that contain I, the probability that uh, the edge IT gets uh, marked, uh, conditioned on I being free, is exactly one over delta TI. Right? For every scenario where i is free, right? remember that a contains i, um, the probability of the edge it being marked is exactly 1 over delta i. 
therefore conditioning doesn't really change. <coughs> I'm just taking a total uh, total uh, probability. Um, all right, so that means that the probability of the edge it getting marked is exactly the probability of the edge it getting marked conditioned on i not being marked before times the probability that i was not marked before. Uh, the first thing by the first line is 1 over delta ti, and the second term by the inductive hypothesis is delta ti over v. The delta ti's cancel out, we get 1 over v. As well. Any questions about this, this, uh, this line? Sorry, David, I was yes. losing. Where the induction comes from? Uh, so the induction is just uh, over t, right? Whenever a new online node shows up, I assume that this was true up until a second ago. And now I'm just showing for like uh, uh, t plus one. Yeah, maybe the words by induction should be somewhere on the slide. <laughs> just be pedantic. Sure. All right. Um, so we're not going to talk about this indicator MIT anymore. So let's just use this uh, this part of the lemma. So the probability of uh, I being free by time t, we claim as delta ti over v. Therefore, for any edge it, the expected weight it is exactly one. Right? It's, this is this was chosen exactly to be one over delta ti. Uh, one over sorry, one over the probability of I being free at time t. So this and this can. Yeah. Boring silence. <laughs> delta ti is not a variable? Delta ti, no. Delta ti is uh, just some value, right? Uh, you agree at this time. Okay. But it's a random variable, right? No, 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 no. Delta ti is just at, at time t, this is your degree so far, right? Uh, your residual degree right now. Just depends on the degree. Uh, unmatched it's not unmatched or unmatched. It's yeah. literally your degree. Okay, so the expected weight of any particular sucker is one, so the expected sum of weights for any online vertex T is exactly D. Which, if you remember from our intuition slides or like a rough sketch of what we wanted to do is at least part of what we did. And the second thing we'll get out of this is a bound of variance. So WTI is basically a scale Bernoulli variable, right? This happens with probability FTI, and we scale it by this value. The variance of a Bernoulli variable is at most its probability of being 1. So this is at most the weight squared times the probability of FTI. Plugging in the value of FTI, we find that this is exactly D over delta TI. Okay. And in particular, if we sum over all neighbors of a particular offline vertex I, it has D of these neighbors. Uh, for the first one, we have DTI, delta TI equals D, then delta TI equals D minus 1, and so on and so forth. So we find that the whole thing is d times the, the dth harmonic number, which is order d. Okay, so we're starting to get some bounds on the variance. Um, let's maybe take a step back and remember why the hell we wanted to actually bound any kind of variance here. Uh, so the first claim we made was that for any online vertex t, the probability that t is not matched by algorithm marking is at most a standard deviation of the weights over d. And this, there's really very little going on in this slide, so let's, let's go through it really quickly. So what's the probability of t not being matched? Well, it's just the probability if the weights are strictly less than 1, then with probability 1 minus wt over d, we don't match it. So this is the expectation of the max 1 minus sum of the weights over d and 0. This is upper bounded by the expectation of, uh, okay, we're doing two steps here, one here. Uh, just replace this max zero with absolute values. And notice that we just said earlier that the expected sum of weights is D. So what we have here is at most the expectation of the absolute different distance between WT and its expectation, all divided by D. Okay. Um, great, so just simplifying, taking a square root and uh, squaring, not really doing anything here. Uh, we find that by uh, concavity, uh, this whole thing is at most square root of expectation of, well, I won't read all of this. <laughs> by definition, this is the square root of the variance over here. Okay. Um, so there wasn't a lot going on here. Don't, I mean, if, if you didn't follow all of it, don't worry about it too much. All, all we want to take away from this is that the probability of T not being matched is somehow characterized by the variance of the weights. Um, all right. 
So I was uh, claiming that we're, we're also going to show some uh, negative correlation of the weights, and somehow that will help us uh, bound the sum of the weights of any particular online node. Uh, let, me, let me take a quick, a quick intermission to uh, tell you about the really useful tool we used to actually get this result. Um, so we're going to talk about negative association for a few minutes. Uh, if you've never heard about this before, negative association is a very uh, nice and natural uh, definition. <coughs> So we say uh, a joint distribution on n variables x1 through xn is negatively associated, or Na for short, if for all monotonically increasing functions f and g that depend on disjoint variables xi, it holds that, the, that f of x and g of x are negatively correlated. Okay, so the covariance of f of x is, uh, and, and g of x is equal to zero. Um, so on the other interpretation, it's basically saying um, whenever I tell you that some subset of the variables is large, conditioning on some subset of, of variables being large, or whatever notion f of large you mean, then the others are going to be small, for whatever notion of you know, small defined by g. Um, all right, this is a bit, of a, a bit of a mouthful. Can anyone give me like a really trivial example of, a, of an NA distribution? Independent variables, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right, so this is, uh, this is uh, trivial, right? So in, in this case, with this uh, negative covariance is uh, covariance uh, zero. And another uh, case of this that we'll uh, rely on is what's uh, termed the zero one lemma or the zero one principle. So binary variables whose sum is always at most one are negatively associated. Okay, and this, I mean, the, just look at it for a second. It's uh, pretty obvious. Uh, if you don't see it, don't, don't worry about it. Just uh, take my word for it for now. Another uh, nice uh, property of, yes, uh, Nick? Did you define it quick? When by like, you know, n minus one, would they still be negatively associated? Uh, n, at least n minus one. Yeah, if, if you put n, I guess that's trivial, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Um, good, so another, uh, so one nice property of uh, negative association is that you can build more elaborate uh, NA distributions from simpler ones by the following closure properties. Uh, so first of all, the union of, the union of independent NA distributions is itself NA. Uh, pretty much follows from the definition. And the uh, second property is if you have a bunch of monotonically increasing functions that depend on disjoint XIs, then the output of these functions is itself NA. Also pretty much follows from the definition. All right, so uh, points one through four here are supposed to be, uh, the, the, the selling point is calculation-free proofs. So it's not quite clear how you prove these things, but uh, given you know, uh, very simple distributions like this, you can build very elaborate ones using these closure properties. Um, some other nice properties of NA distributions are, first of all, we have a pairwise, pairwise negative correlation. That's uh, pretty obvious, right? The Fs will just be some Xi. Uh, right? F and G will be Xi and Xj. Uh, so we get pairwise negative correlation. Too surprising. We have stronger uh, notions of negative dependence. Uh, also, for the algorith uh, algorithmic uh, crowd out there, uh, NA, NA variables also allow for the applicability of uh, Chernoff Hofting uh, type bounds. Right, so, the, the marketing line to remember here is independent or better. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm really not doing this uh, topic justice in uh, you know, two or three minutes I spent on this slide. If you want to read more, just uh, I have some notes online. Okay, so now that we have uh, this notion of negative uh, association, let's get back to analyzing our algorithm. Um, so the claim is that the variables <coughs> mit, so the indicators of whether or not i and t were marked, uh, so the edge it was marked, conditioned on the set of unmarked uh, neighbors is negatively associated. Um, right, so this is, this is really a very, very short proof given uh, what we saw in the previous slide. So conditioned on A being the set of unmarked neighbors. Uh, a node I can be marked when it was matched to T. This is only one of these guys, and these are binary variables. They're NA, so it's zero, one, then. On the other hand, if we toss independent coins with the right probability, well, they're in NA, because they're independent. The union of these guys is independent, right? I mean, X, the XIs and the YIs are independent, so their union is itself NA. And finally, if we look at MIT, which is just the, um, 
the or of xi and uh, yi. These are monotonically increasing, depend on disjoint variables, so they're two cells. Right. Proof is very simple. We don't need to calculate anything. Right. right. Um, okay, so what, we, what do we get from this? So first of all, I claim that we get negative correlation between FTI and FTJ, uh, which in particular means that the weights WTI and WTJ are negatively correlated. Right? The weights are just these indicators times some, some value. And uh, in particular, we find that the sum, that the variance of, uh, w, of WT is at most the sum of the individual variances of the WTI. Okay. Um, okay. So I think I'll skip one or two of these proofs, but I actually do want to show you uh, why, the, why the FTIs are negative. So I claim that uh, the FTIs are negatively correlated, pairwise negatively correlated. And the proof is, oh, here at least I have by induction on T. Uh, so the proof is by, induct by induction on T, and the base is trivial. At first, you know, everyone's unmarked, so, so these are constant variables of one. And now uh, for step, uh, for the inductive step, if I and J are both neighbors of online vertex T plus one, the probability of I being free after t plus one, after time t plus one, is the probability that it wasn't marked at time t, and uh, sorry, that it's okay. the probability that it wasn't marked until time t plus one is the probability that it wasn't marked at time t, and it wasn't marked before time t. So you may or may not remember that we computed this to be one minus one over delta ti earlier on, and we computed the complement of this as one over delta ti, so we get this, and just pushing, pushing that. Okay, uh, but on the other hand, the probability that both of these guys are free by time t plus one, well, it's just, um, again, just chasing definitions, is the probability that both of these didn't get marked at time t, and they were free at time t. Okay, uh, so the first term by the inductive hypothesis is going to be at most the product of these two. And the second term, and the first term by uh, negative association, conditional negative association, and therefore conditional negative correlation is going to be at most the product of these terms. <coughs> Maybe give this a couple more minutes. Um, all right, and from this we just find that the probability of both of these happening is at most the product of the probabilities, and so the covariance is Great. Great. Um, okay, so skim through one or two other proofs. So from previous results we showed that the sum, I claim that the sum of the standard deviations of WT is at most n times square root d log b. So the, I mean, if you divide through by n, this is the average I was talking about earlier. And uh, I'll just maybe highlight two points that we showed before. So the sum of the variances is at most uh, sum of the variances of the weights, rearranging, not doing much here. This term over here we proved is at most d log d earlier. And then maybe a few applications of convexity later, we find that the expected variance is at most square root, square root d log d. And we get this. All right, great. And now we can actually prove our main results. So algorithm marking on d regular graphs is one minus order square root log d over square root d convexity. So the number of nodes that the algorithm doesn't match, which you've Notice as uh, the algorithm's loss. It is most the sum over online nodes t of the probability of t not being matched. A few slides ago, we argued that this is the most square root of uh, the sum of t, uh, sum over t of the standard deviation of wt over g. In the previous slide, we went over this a little fast. We showed that this is n times square root t log v. And simplifying a bit, we get this expression. And therefore, the expected size of the algorithm's matching is n minus n square root log d. Uh, we're a lot more, uh, maybe a little too uh, technical towards the end. Hope I didn't uh, wear you out completely. And I'll just leave you with, uh, with the results slide, and thank you for your time. Yeah, so 
So in, in some sense, what we're doing here is um, we're doing some kind of online dependent grounding. So we said that we're talking about this one over the uh, target. That's the optimal fractional solution. And if you generalize what we did here, we get something that somehow depends on the variance of this fractional solution. Uh, I'd have to maybe you know, play around with some, uh, some values just to see what, what's a good fractional solution in this case. So I can't tell you off the top of my head. I'd be happy to talk about that. Yes, sir. So, so sort of a similar question. I mean, imagine that it's regular in the sense that all the online guys have the same degree and all the offline services have things that are different. Like, is that? Uh, in that case, if the online vertices have a higher degree than the offline vertices, we can get the same, the same bound, with uh, B being the online vertices uh, degree, which is, I guess, better. Um, yeah, so that's what that case would be. Okay. Okay. Um, especially for the lower batch, are we thinking about like what over square B is sort of coming to the birthday paradox, sort of like if like the temple of the edges optimally um, um, get like a certain number of collisions? Sim simpler than that, just oh. you know, plain old variance. Okay. I, I mean, I can, I can scribble the example on the whiteboard. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's kind of how the Birkin paradox comes Is negative association a, a, a concept that you came up with for, the, for, for this specific oh, no, application? Oh, no, no, no. Or is it, or, or, I, or, I wish, yeah. In which case, what was the original motivation for considering it? I mean, it's, it, I, mean, I mean, it's certainly natural, but there must be something that... Uh, like motivation, let's see. So the, the original papers that considered it were mainly, I mean, just math papers, like probability papers saying, here's a nice, uh, pro uh, let's see, here's a nice uh, property, here's a bunch of examples that uh, satisfy this. So zero one principle, for example, only came around maybe like a decade after someone even came up with this uh, definition. Uh, permutation distributions, for example, RNA, which is... I mean, help is, is useful if you want to prove a bunch of you know, negative correlation properties which people assume. Um, yeah, anyway, read up on that. It's a really, really cool concept. Um, can you yes. speak to us in 